Hello and welcome everyone to today's book discussion. Today we have with us Dr. Raffaello Pantushi, Senior uh, Associate Fellow, Royal, um, Royal United Services Institute and Senior Visiting Fellow, uh, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Uh, he'll share with us insights from his recently released co-authored book titled Sinostan, China's Inadvertent Empire. We also have with us a great panel. We have Professor uh, Rityusha Mani Tiwari, Assistant Professor, Shahid Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi, and Honorary Fellow, the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Ayaz Wani, Research Fellow at ORF. Uh, they will be uh, uh, discussing Dr. Uh, Pantushi's book. Uh, to start with, uh, the book provides a unique perspective on China's growing influence in Central Asia and explores its impact on the complicated Russia-China relations. Um, this is an important read, uh, especially in the backdrop of two important developments in the region. Uh, first is the American withdrawal from Afghanistan in August 2021. And second is Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Um, further, what makes this book particularly special is that it is all at the same time a fun travelogue, a detailed report on complex geopolitics in the region, as well as a rich posthumous tribute to the co-author of this book, um, Alexandros Peterson. So without further delay, let me just um, hand over the floor to Dr. Pantushi to tell us more about, uh, about this book. Dr. Pantushi. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singh. Thank you for the kind invitation to ORF for organizing uh, this book event. It's a real pleasure uh, to come and talk to you about the book. And, you know, having uh, visited ORF in Delhi a number of times, I'm honored that you, you've invited me along to this. And I look forward to hopefully picking up this discussion in person one day soon as well. Um, the book, uh, which I have a copy of here, um, is one that, uh, as you pointed out, is, is one that is actually co-authored with a good friend of mine, Alexandre Peterson, who was sadly murdered in Kabul in 2014 um, in an attack there while he was working at Kabul University. But the book is a product of a project that the two of us started uh, back in sort of 2010. Um, and at the time, we were interested in trying to basically understand, you know, Central Asia and China's relations with Central Asia. You know, it was a very different time back then. And sort of China's, uh, as a kind of global player, was in a very different place. The whole discourse around China is very different, but you know we were people who were very interested in Central Asia, and we're very interested in noticing. We observed from our sort of early research and early discussions with people there that China was an interesting and coming force. You know, Russia was still kind of the dominant power, but China was increasingly becoming a more significant player uh, throughout the region and really across the board. And so, you know, we thought, well, this is something we should try to understand. And we were quite interested in it. We also enjoyed traveling around the region a lot. And frankly, the book gave us a wonderful opportunity to do that. So we secured some project funding and we uh, decided, to, you know, we managed to start doing it. And we went and traveled around all five of the Central Asian countries. We got to Afghanistan, we went all over China uh, a number of times. And then sadly, Alex was killed. Um, at which point, you know, we had a manuscript of sorts that was sort of starting to come together, um, but that wasn't quite finished. And then frankly, it's taken me the next, you know, five or six years to finally get the book over the line to where we are today. But in the meantime, I've continued to travel around the region. So this book is really informed by, you know, a rich on the ground experience, uh, both within the region, but also beyond it. You know, on a number of visits and projects I was doing in my various think tank jobs, um, I got to engage with Chinese, with Indian, with Central Asian, with Iranian, with, you know, Pakistani, with Afghan, with Russian experts on uh, this particular region. So it's really all informed by this kind of larger hello. experience of people. Um, hello, Dr. Wani, I think you're... Yeah, hello, uh, hello, hello. Your, your you microphone can, you now works. Us. Thank so you, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Mr. Karan. So the book is uh, the book is very much informed by that, and it tries to draw out you know what has been happening on the ground using you know not only sort of elite level conversations and discussions that we had in all of the capitals uh, and some sort of major cities you know with experts, but also getting out onto the ground. You know we managed to get out to the border posts uh, to go see what was actually happening. Went to the markets. Went to you know visit sites of Chinese companies that were sort of doing projects around the region, and you know all of that fed into this bigger picture which kind of comes to a sense of a region where China is increasingly becoming the kind of most consequential power on the ground, but is doing this in a way that is sort of inadvertent. It's not necessarily something that's sort of premeditated and thought through by China. It's something that's happening because China is really interested in Xinjiang. 
And you know, this is where a kind of a map is useful because if you look at a map of Central Asia and you look at Xinjiang, which is you know China's uh, region uh, which abuts uh, uh, Central Asia, which you know of course is in the news at the moment because of what we see happening to Uyghur people there. Um, this is a region which, in many ways, you know, I would argue is the sixth or seventh Central Asian country. You know, now I, I say sixth or seventh because I know in some people's you know calculations, Afghanistan is also included within the sort of conceptions of Central Asia. Uh, but I would argue that Xinjiang is in many ways similar. You know, in the sense that it has got a kind of Turkic community that lives there, uh, very similar to the Central Asians. Um, it's you know, it, it's got within it large Central Asian communities. There's you know one million Kazakhs living in Xinjiang. There are many thousands of Tajiks and ethnic Kyrgyz living in the sort of border regions that China has with uh, with Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Um, and, you know, similarly, in Central Asia, there's large Uyghur communities. You know, these were ultimately nomadic tribes that were sort of roaming around when the sort of borders were defined. And so this means that this is a region which is very intimately tied to uh, Central Asia, uh, Xinjiang, that is. Um, but it also means that it suffers from some of the same issues. That Central Asia suffers from, which is a kind of landlockedness, you know, an inaccessibility to the world's waterways, which is ultimately where most of kind of global trade and transit really goes. So, you know, for all of the issues that you see in Central Asia around connectivity, uh, around, you know, large empty spaces with little infrastructure, they're very true in Xinjiang as well. Um, but Xinjiang is a part of China, which has unfortunately got at its core this clash between a kind of uh, ethnic a minority Uyghur community and an ethnic, uh, you know, and the increasing majority Han community. The Han community, of course, is majority across China, but within Xinjiang specifically, it's, you know, it's only relatively recently become a sort of majority community as well. Um, and this has created a tension and a clash that really came to a head, I think, in, uh, in 2009. Uh, well, most recently it came to a head in 2009 when we saw large scale rioting in Urumqi, uh, when mobs of Uyghurs went around and were attacking a random hand that they found after stories had spread in the region of a, a horrible incident that happened in Guangzhou against some Uyghur workers living uh, in that part of the country. Um, and this led to a counter protest the next day and basically general instability in Xinjiang. Instability that forced the leader at the time, Hu Zintao, to leave a G7 or G8, sorry, summit that he was attending in L'Aquila, Italy at the time, to come back to China to help manage the situation. And that's, I think, a significant point. And this is kind of, in some ways, the departure point for our research, because at that point, you know, you see a real a push from China. Now, China had always had a very heavy security presence in the region. And we see after 2009, it sort of starts to ratchet up even more. But also, you'd also seen over time that there had been an effort to try to develop Xinjiang. You know, this idea of developing the West of China is something that we've seen successive Chinese leaders try to do, recognizing that, you know, since the great opening in 92, um, uh, you know, with Deng Xiaoping's famous tour of the South and, you know, the opening up of China that that led to, you know, that was really a coastal story. But when you looked inland, you found actually a part of China that was still very underdeveloped. Now, in 94, the then Premier Li Peng went on a tour of the region, you know, visiting all of the Central Asian capitals except for Dushanbe um, in an attempt to sort of replicate this kind of opening in, into this direction as well. But, you know, and, you know, it, did, it didn't quite take off in the same way. At the time, the narratives he was talking about are ones that we would very much recognize today, which is on the one hand, worrying about dissidents in Central Asia, using it as a place to come and sort of cause trouble in China, but also about Silk Roads and connectivity. But connectivity that started in Central Asia went across China, ultimately to Japan. Because, of course, in the 1990s, you know, the big boom economic story was, you know, Japan rather than at the time China. That sort of came a little bit later. And so, you know, we can see that this narrative of, you know, connectivity and security questions linking Central Asia to China is something that's been sort of constant with uh, the region uh, and China's relations with it from, you know, the end of the Cold War. Um, the other institution that's worth mentioning at this point, which, you know, in the course of the research of the book, we did manage to go visit uh, a number of times uh, in its various headquarters, uh, is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that was first born at the end of the uh, Cold War um, out of a sort of border delineation grouping that brought together, you know, the, what was called the Shanghai Five, which is Shanghai, uh, I'm sorry, China, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Russia. It's basically China and the countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union um, that it then, you know, when the Soviet Union fell apart, it then suddenly bordered four new countries. Um, and this grouping was essentially a border delineation structure. In 2001, you know, it proved to be such a successful format that Uzbekistan joined it and it became the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. 
Um, and this becomes kind of the umbrella entity that you see China doing a lot of engagement in the region uh, with. But what we noticed, you know, having visited all these institutions and talked to a lot of the people there, was while it was clear that there was some business being done through here, from a Chinese perspective, the real push was at a bilateral level. You know, and this is something you consistently see in all the sort of different fields, is that China and Chinese companies engage across this region, uh, you know, in a bilateral way, but in a multilateral way as well. And they do them all at the same time. And this kind of multifaceted effort and push into the region um, is one that in some ways, you know, it's very driven from a Chinese perspective by one, a security concern, uh, which is ultimately about trying to make sure Xinjiang uh, becomes stable. But two, you know, the stability that China wants in Xinjiang is something that will, on the one hand, need to come from a heavy security presence, but the longer term stability will have to be economic development. And this is, you know, where we see, uh, you know, the big sort of economic push and the big economic story coming. Because from a Chinese sort of view, the idea is, you know, well, if the place is rich and prosperous, then it will help Xinjiang become rich and prosperous and therefore stable. Because ultimately, Xinjiang is as landlocked as any of the Central Asian countries it's next to. If you want to make this area rich and prosperous, you're going to have to make it more connected to the world. You're going to have to open it up. And this kind of becomes the big driving force of Chinese policy towards Xinjiang um, after 2009 on the economic side. Heavy economic investment into Xinjiang, but ultimately connectivity out to help that investment really become successful and prosperous. Now, what's interesting, and this brings me to you know, uh, the second time marker, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this to kind of start to wrap up because I'm conscious I just want to sort of get the ball rolling with some thoughts, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, colleagues' thoughts and getting into a discussion, is, you know, as we're doing this project, and as I say, we started in about 2010, you know, and we've done rounds of visits around the region in 2011 and 2012, you know, and in, in 2013, we were visiting Beijing, uh, you know, uh, touching base with various people there, and you know, uh, we were there at the time when Xi Jinping went to Astana, uh, what was then called Astana, is now called Nur Sultan, the capital of Kazakhstan, and gave a speech where he announced the creation of a Silk Road economic belt. Um, a month later, he went to Jakarta uh, and in the Indonesian parliament gave another speech in which he talked about the creation of a 21st century maritime Silk Road. And these two become merged together to become the Belt and Road Initiative that, you know, we all know and love um, today. But I think it's no accident that he started this set of speeches in uh, Kazakhstan. Because in a way, what he was doing was stamping his imprint and giving a name to something that had been happening in the region for, you know, a decade or more before, which was this idea of sort of connectivity and putting connectivity and using economic prosperity as the kind of lens through which you're engaging with countries as the kind of driving force of your foreign policy, the central conception of it. And, you know, with the creation of the Belt and Road Initiative, in many ways, he kind of globalized that narrative. And so now we see this kind of idea of what had been happening in Central Asia all this time before, which is of trying to, you know, encourage prosperity and building roads and links and connectivity, helping China develop while at the same time, you know, bringing all this connectivity and wonderful things to the world, you know, becomes the leitmotif or the narrative or the rubric that China uses for its engagement with foreign policy all over the world. Um, and so in many ways, you know, this is uh, the key point. And in some ways, the the key conception that we're trying to sort of advance with the book is this idea that, you know, um, not only have you got here this interesting idea of central China's engagement in Central Asia happening in a way that China isn't really thinking through the consequences of it, um, but on the other hand, you're also seeing, you know, a part of the uh, a kind of a foreign policy approach in the world, which is the kind of the driving idea that China is using now everywhere else as well. So the point being that you can look at Central Asia and maybe learn a little bit about what China's sort of bigger visions for its foreign policy are, because this is very much kind of the test ground for where it's tried out a lot of its big uh, sort of foreign policy ideas. Um, I'll maybe pause there uh, because I'm conscious that you wanted me to uh, talk for about 10, 15 minutes. I think I'm getting towards that time. Um, but I will throw out two hooks for things that I haven't touched on, but I very much hope we can bring up in the discussion, which is one is Afghanistan, which is a whole chapter in the book and I think is, is a really important. It's kind of a, a, an example of, of this bigger narrative I'm talking about. And then the second is Russia, which is, of course, uh, critical if we're thinking about uh, you know, the China-Russia relation within the context of Ukraine. Um, and I think, you know, talking about Russia uh, uh, in an Indian context is particularly interesting, given the very complicated relationships that I know exist around that. So uh, I'll throw those two hooks out there, and I very much look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Pantushi, for that wonderful um, uh, introduction. Uh, I'll now request uh, Professor Ratusha.
uh, to share her views of the book. Professor, the floor is all yours. Thank you, thank you, Antra, and thank you, fellow, um, and congratulations on this book. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, be here and discuss it, uh, especially because uh, we have crossed paths in uh, Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences while I think you were your uh, first book, and perhaps the beginnings of this been there. Uh, so it's, it's it's really great to see this uh, book come to fruition. Um, and uh, as someone who observes regions very keenly, I immensely enjoyed the book. Um, and the book has an interesting and compelling argument because it brings region to uh, the whole centrality of you know IR theory as well as um, I mean moving away from heavy IR theorization. The book also at the same time serves as a very interesting travelogue. Uh, and perhaps one of the most uh, one of the key questions that everybody seems to be grappling with while they are trying to unravel the puzzle that China is, uh, what kind of power China is likely to be? And the central argument of the book that um, if you look at the region, at least Central Asia, the the answer has to be uh, not some kind of homogenous, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, homogenous prognosis about the nature of power that China is likely to be or is is already. In fact, it has to be seen in the context of the region that it's operating in. So the book. The, the book posits that you know China's growing rule, ro role in Central Asian region is inadvertent and incidental. And if you combine it with traditional wisdom, uh, one can see it as the add-on stakes when trade begins. So uh, the Chinese policy makers perhaps seems to, uh, seem to have had a rich harvest of all of these unintentional uh, consequences in terms of expanding sphere of influence and so on and so forth. Uh, what, what interestingly happens here in the course of this book is that while capturing the day-to-day -day nitty gritty of trade, bringing in the stories of travelers, traders, migrant workers, um, scholars, officials, the working class, um, in this region, the authors have managed to offer a very deep insight. Um, and I would say that it has also, the book has also uh, pushed us to move the narrative away from a statist perspective on looking at power, on looking at how countries uh, behave in a certain way. And uh, that behavior, it's not necessarily reflected from a statist perspective. It can be captured, it can be experienced, and it can be a lived experience uh, uh, from people's eye. So this narrative is very much a people's uh, you know, perspective in that sense. Uh, and those scholars have traveled as travelers and uh, they have managed to bring about an exchange of you know peoples in that kind of a uh, uh, sense and so when we're looking at rise of china uh, the totality of combining the policymakers perspective combining the official narrative with the real actual experience of the people of the surrounding regions is something that uh, separates that book from uh, the thread of the mill affair about when we when we look at regions in in terms of security, in terms of foreign policy, and so on and so forth. Um, at the same time, I'm I'm sure that while the the this book was evolving, uh, there are people who and there are scholars who've already kind of uh, grappled with this question, and I'm sure you've also come across with this question that um, if it's it's the case that in Central Asia, what China seems to have developed as a seem, uh, as a sphere of influence, um, as an unintentional consequence of its simply simply expanding its you know trade and uh, uh, basing its relations primarily from an economic sense of view. Um, what about its policies in other regions? So you see, do, do you also see a kind of comparative of Central Asia in some other regions? Um, if you simply look at, uh, you know, Belt and Road, for instance, are there other regions which can also be sort of grouped together, clubbed together with Central Asia in, in terms of the Chinese policymakers being only interested in trade and uh, the expansion of economic uh, uh, ties in that region? And perhaps anything other than that, that they uh, glean in, in terms of leverages, in terms of stakes, in terms of growing influence of power, uh, that's it, that's inadvertent. So would you put any other region akin to Central Asia? And if not, then what is it that separates Central Asia? What is the uh, unique uh, uh, feature of Central Asia that, that kind of compels uh, us to read Central Asia separately from any other region. So that's I'm, I'm sure you've come across a question of, of similar nature, but um, it would be really interesting to, to sign, kind of 
read a post script uh, if possible from you on this or or me maybe even during the course of discussion we we can have some 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 pointers in that sense uh, another uh, thing is that um, I mean, the ambivalence that you've talked about that China has in this region. And of course, this region has come to fore primarily because of, I mean, the interesting context that has uh, developed in the last uh, couple of years is, is, of course, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine and uh, America's withdrawal from Afghanistan. So these two uh, particular contexts have brought this region to forefront of geo strategy and geo economics um, again at the world stage. And we are looking at this region very, very uh, uh, keenly and minutely. So in that sense, do you think that uh, from a position of ambivalence, China has been pushed to uh, sort of take a more decisive turn, as it were? Uh, is it that China can no longer afford the luxury of being just an incidental empire in this region, it has to pick up a particular kind of stance. And that would mean that the nature of power that it wields in the region uh, kind of changes and it, it undergoes major shifts. I mean, I'm sure that this, this is something that you've been thinking all along uh, because, uh, I mean, one knew about uh, both the possibilities, the American withdrawal as well as uh, Russia's equations in, in the region. Uh, but now that the possibilities have taken a kind of decisive turn, uh, how does it impact your original uh, hypothesis? So that's that's my uh, second uh, kind of question. Uh, the third and final one is that, do you see a disjuncture uh, between the experiences that you managed to um, uh, you know, come across while you were working on this book, the experiences of common people, common working class, and you know, the policy makers, was it the case that, you know, the Central Asian countries that you were uh, uh, looking at uh, in different Central Asian countries, different uh, public policy was there uh, in, in terms of how they were looking at the role of China, uh, the developmental uh, investment that China could afford for the region and uh, which is why they might have gotten together with China in the first place. Uh, was there a disjuncture? Was the public, was the working class uh, expecting or not expecting certain things when China's influence was growing in the region? Um, and was there any kind of dissonance between the policymakers and the common people, common working class, who was actually experiencing what it meant to have larger growing influence in the region? So if, if there is a kind of hint in that dissonance, of, of that dissonance or of that disjuncture, that would be really interesting to capture. So I'll rest my thoughts here, and I'm sure we can come up with a second round of discussion, time permitting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for that interesting critique on Dr. Uh, Pantoshi's work. Uh, I would now request Dr. Wani to uh, share his perspectives. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, first of all, I will start by thanking Dr. Raffaello and late Alexandros Peterson for such a qualitative and well-researched academic book that has once again opened the debate of Chinese interests in the Central Asian Republics in particular and Greater Eurasia in general. My research interests in the region started in 2009 when I was an MPhil student when Urumqi writers did take place. And I also did my PhD on Xinjiang. But during my PhD, I went through the Two books that vividly discussed China's rise in Central Asia. One was written by Michael Clark, Australian professor, that provides an account how China evolved, evolving integration policies in Xinjiang have influenced its foreign policy in Central Asia. Second was by Hassan H. Karar, the new Silk Road diplomacy, China's Central Asia foreign policy since Cold War. It was published in 2009. So after those two books, I think after the, a gap of 10 years, the book Sinostan, China's Inadvertent Empire, gives a detailed account how China has been taking a lead in Central Asia. As Central Asia sits at the heart of Eurasia and historically made up of the ancient Silk Route. Indeed, as geographer Halford Mackander observed, he who controls the heartland controls the world. China has perhaps the biggest economic footprint in Central Asia today, principally owing to its massive projects and the Belt and Road 
initiative. The book has beautifully and academically highlighted the Chinese policy in Central Asia, driven by Xinjiang and its long-term stability. They not only need total ideological control, but they also have to offer an economic opportunity, which is being brilliantly discussed in this book by Dr. Raffaello and his colleague. Xinjiang is a province that is in northwest part of China and is having a critical link for countries BRI. It is home of Uyghurs, one of the number of prosecuted Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. Beijing is facing accusations and using hardline methods to suppress the Uyghurs, especially after 2014. It is, this all has been highlighted in this book in a novel way. When one reads the book, it gets the essence that how China is doing it in Xinjiang. But somehow, somehow after independence, given the cultural integrity between Xinjiang and Central Asia and more than 4 lakh Uyghurs who are living in Central Asian countries, started anti-Chinese activities. Parties like Uyghur Liberation Organization and Free Uyghurstan Party were formed in different parts of Central Asia. And furthermore, there were many Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, and Tajikis living in Xinjiang. So, this book highlights all the integrities and all the nuisance why China makes Central Asia its focal point after the breakup of Soviet Union. Secondly, the Chinese approach towards Central Asia where a combination of security, economic and cultural efforts have been instituted across the region. The book also gives a detailed account on history and the scientific tendencies of Xinjiang. I was very much impressed by Dr. Raffaello when he writes about Jakub Beg's era, 18. 65 to 1877. Yakubek, who is still today venerated by many independence minded Uyghurs, especially the Uyghur exiles, he, he declared his allegiance to Khalifa of Constantinople and even tried to have a treaty with British India. He cemented Muslim Turkish identity of the region in opposition to China and, chi and it forced China to recapture the area from Yakub Beg and was formally incorporated in the Chinese Empire as a province in 1878. The book also gives new insights on XPCC, Xinjiang Production, Construction and Crop, Construction Crops, how since their establishment, how they have been used by China to subjugate the national minorities in Xinjiang and also for various political, economic and geostrategic reasons. The political reason was kept was to keep the strategic, strategic area under the hold of CPC. Economically, the reason was to accommodate China's large population of Hans in less populated areas and provinces for their effective economic rehabilitation. Strategically, China also aimed to check the centrifugal tendencies of the natives by diversifying regional ethnicity. That was also done via XPCC. That is why the population demography of Xinjiang has changed a lot from 1949. It was only 4% and now it is 4% of Hanus and now it is more than 50% of Hanus. The book also gives references of economic, constant economic and political references of constant economic and political instability in Central Asia after the breakup of so Soviet Union and how China uses this economic and political instability in Central Asia for its own purposes, for the security of Xinjiang, for the security of its own volatile province. As many there were many insurgencies in Xinjiang, but this book gives a vivid picture of the Eurasian region, how China is doing things for its own particular interests. The book 
in it is one, one chapter describes how china also uses the shanghai corporation organization a multilateral forum established under the under its leadership in 2001 as a tool to increase its grip over the region in return for chinese loans and investments for example in 1997 the ka central asian republics were forced to ban uyghur organization in 1997 they also in were forced to intensify surveillance of the resident uyghur population the book also gives detailed account on how china praises seo being focused on countering three evils terrorism separatism extremism that preoccupied beijing this ultimately provide a glue to hold the organization together the author authors also discussed in a novel way how china has fomented the fault lines within seo by using bilateral diplomacy to serve its interests driven by security interests in xinjiang china adopted a narrow approach or self driven diplomacy to hobnob with taliban causing further tensions within the region the relationship between china and taliban as beautifully discussed by the authors goes back to 2000 when chinese ambassador to pakistan met taliban leaders mulla umar to court taliban and other terror groups by containing any super power of terrorism in xinjiang however some uh, my argument here is i want to ask dr fellow that did you your good self feel that china after 1987 said that the economic development is only answer to instability of xinjiang did your good self feel that the more they do economic development the more hans they the more hans they migrate to xinjiang that is the one problem secondly even when we see the bri belt and road initiative the more and more uyghurs feel economically exploited because they are the natives of xinjiang they feel exploited that is why their exploitation changes into centrifugal tendencies the first question maybe this second thought to my understanding is even though the economic integration with the greater eurasia region or what may we may say the greater central asia helped china somewhat to tame the centrifugal tendencies in xinjiang but on the other hand if we see uyghurs used the same thing to create a unique identity till 1949 or till 1980 the uyghurs used to say we were kashgaris khotanis turfanis yarkandis but now they say we are uyghurs the single global identity and these, these two things if dr rafaelo can answer and can have a project on these two things so that can help us a lot and thank you sir for such a wonderful book i personally feel that after 10 years i got something in my hand that is changing my mind and from last 3 days i read it two times and i will sit and read and read it to get new points thank you sir thank you dr vani for that wonderful uh, uh, you know remarks and i would now request uh, dr uh, pantushi to uh, to respond to some of the comments uh, or the questions that have been put forward by our discussants of course uh, thank you so much and i i greatly appreciate uh, the comments and the the clear the deep engagement with the text i mean i you know i i am honored that you guys have all taken the time to read it so in such detail so thank you very much and you know it's it's wonderful uh i'm delighted that uh, you know i'm bumping into someone here who uh, we uh, we met at the shanghai academy of many many years ago um you know in in a very different shanghai now i would say so i think if we were there today we wouldn't be able to meet up actually but anyway um <clears throat>
So, it's some really interesting questions. So, you know, I, I'm probably, I won't react to the comments, which I think are really interesting, um, but I will try to react to the specific questions that I think both of them put forward because they raise a number of issues and I think it can push us in, in, in some really interesting directions. I think, you know, to start with uh, Retusius, you know, the, um, the question of where, you know, do I see a comparative uh, somewhere else? You know, I think that's, uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, and, you know, there's always a danger, of course, you know, being in, being a researcher who looks at this region, I think it's the only region that matters and nothing else is like it. And of course, you know, so one has to sort of step back and think objectively about it. And, you know, the truth is, I think it's possible that we might be able to sketch some similar narratives or strands in Southeast Asia, you know, and the parts of Southeast Asia that China has sort of proximity to. And, you know, of course, you know, the BRI, you know, was born in, in Kazakhstan in 19, uh, in, I'm sorry, in, in 2013. But, you know, in 1999, there was the famous Bangladesh China India Myanmar corridor, which is kind of, the, you know, the precursor in some ways to the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, you go back and look at the, you know, the, what was it, the Yunnan Academy um, in 99, where they had the meeting of the, the first meeting of the kind of BCIM economic corridor, you know, and, and you look at the sort of list of what the plan of action is, you know, it echoes <laughs> a lot with what we then see ultimately articulated as the BRI. But I think the key difference is it never took off that, you know, it never really happened. You know, BCIM is still being talked about. You know, I think these days less so because, you know, China-India relations have gotten so parlous. But, you know, it, it, it is still a kind of concept. So it's never quite materialized in the same way. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that you might be able to find some comparisons in that direction. But where I think there is a distinction here, and this, I think, ties into a, a bit of what Dr. Wani was saying and also the just importance of Xinjiang is that, you know, the, the whole vision here is, uh, or my interpretation of the vision is, you know, that, to make Central Asia prosper, to make Xinjiang prosperous and stable, you need to have a prosperous, stable region next to it. And so that ties what's happening there and what China is trying to achieve there directly to a key core security, domestic security concern. And that I can't think is replicated in many other places. I mean, you could maybe paint a similar narrative in Tibet, but it's, you know, because of the Tibetan relationship with India, possibly, but I think it's different. You know what I mean? It's a very different kind of level of violence and political and certainly we've seen there. And, and if we think now on the sort of global stage, you know, how Xinjiang has become kind of the focus in many ways of the kind of pushback against China on, on the world stage, we can see how it's really sharpened even further. So I would argue that there is something quite unique about this, but I would also say that there are clearly shadows and shades you could see of similar approaches in, in I think, Southeast Asia and South Asia in particular. Um, so, so that would be my, my thoughts on that one. But, you know, I do think there is something particular about it. And then the other thing, you know, the one that people often say is they say, well, you know, this is just like China's investments in Africa. And that doesn't hold water with me. Africa is the other side of the world. You know, if, if China does a project in some, you know, uh, African country and it goes wrong, cut your losses, move on to the next one. Let's pretend that never happened, right? In Central Asia, you can't do that because it's just next door. You know, this goes wrong then you've got consequences that you're going to feel potentially directly on your borders and right at home and right into a very in, into a part of China that's very sensitive. So I think there is something quite unique about it uh, from a Chinese perspective. Um, I think that then brings me on to the second, your second question of, you know, is China being pushed into a role here? Is China going to be pushed into a role? And, you know, that's this is the part that I see increasingly coming, realizing itself now, frankly, because if we look on the ground, and I think Afghanistan is kind of the perfect articulation of this. You know, the Chinese, um, and uh, as Dr. Wani was pointing out, you know, the Chinese have engaged in Afghanistan with the Taliban for decades, you know. Now, initially, it was relationships through Islamabad, you know, and, and very much one that was mediated through there, and it still is to some degree, but I think increasingly, and I'd argue the turning point was probably in the, you know, early 2010s, 2012, 2013, where you saw, you know, the Obama administration at the time was talking about leaving Afghanistan, um, you know, and you had the big, the big narrative of withdrawal, which then didn't materialize for another seven years. Um, at that point, you see the Chinese starting to be a bit more forward in how open they are with the engagements of the Taliban. And we see that relationship sort of becoming more open and, I mean, not transparent, but, you know, it wasn't, it was one that they were talking about. You know, you could get people to actually refer to it and not just sort of deny it till they're blue in the face, you know, when you knew it was happening, but, you know, they would say, oh, no, nothing happening. I mean, they would actually admit it and you'd see official statements about it. Xinhua even started hinting about it. And they actually tried to help bring the Pakistanis and the Taliban to the table with the Afghan government and uh, uh, the Americans. So, you know, there was kind of the Chinese were getting engaged and showing they had some kind of skin in this game. Um, but at the same time, the Americans stayed. 
you know, and I think part of why the Chinese were doing that was because they realized that there was potentially an end happening here soon, and they should kind of be a bit more forward looking. Um, but it didn't happen. The Americans never left, but the Chinese continued that engagement. It got sort of more and more intense. But what was interesting was they also, you know, they maintained a good relationship both with the Taliban, but also with the Republic government. You know, and I we did a lot of projects uh, at this time, you know, when I, when I moved back to London in 2013 or 2014 to work at RUSI, you know, a lot of the projects we were doing in London was, you know, looking at how China could, you know, do more in Afghanistan. And the UK was interested in engaging with them. At one point, we were doing a project looking how China and India could cooperate in Afghanistan. You know, and this is something that I know President Modi and, and she were talking about um, as well at one point, you know, again, before things got particularly negative. But, you know, so there was this kind of this effort by China. But what was interesting was, you know, they continued to engage with both sides and they never really committed and they just kind of hedged. But the point at the time, right, and, and it was that they could get away with this hedge because at the end of the day, the Americans were there delivering hard security outcomes and kind of providing that security umbrella and dealing with the, the militancy and the violence that was emanating. And this was kind of containing the problems into Afghanistan. Now, what we've seen happen since last year in the fall of Kabul is, of course, you know, that's changed. The Americans are no longer present, but the Chinese still are, <laughs> you know, and in fact, they've tried to increase their kind of levels of engagement with the Taliban. And it's interesting to think that, you know, they had good relations with the government before and they have good relations with the government now. And I think that speaks to the ability of kind of their ability to kind of straddle the fence and hedge and present themselves essentially as kind of an economic partner to these people. But the difference now is in Afghanistan. The Americans aren't there. You know, that heavy security presence that was ultimately keeping the stability and keeping the militancy within Afghanistan is gone. Now, that's meant that violence in Afghanistan is way down, which is wonderful uh, for the Afghan people who've suffered for, you know, sent decades now. You know, but unfortunately, we've seen that it started to mean violence is going into Central Asia and into Pakistan. And we're starting to see the kind of violence going in those directions. And so who's going to help stabilize that situation? Now, the Pakistanis are trying clearly and they will focus on it. And the Central Asians as well are doing their bit. To but, you know, you haven't got that same kind of power there they're doing. It. And I think increasingly to see people looking to China to do that. And China doesn't want to do that. And China won't. And I think, you know, it's possible at some point we'll see anything pulled into it so they can't get away from it. But, you know, it is it is an interesting question to ask, you know, at what point will that tipping point come that they are ob obligated to? Because at the moment, they take a very transactional approach to these things. You know, it's very much, you know, we have our narrow security concerns, which is Uyghurs and our borders, uh, you know, and our people if they get killed in these countries. But beyond that, stability and stability, we don't really care. That's your problem, local country, whichever one it is. We're not going to sort of provide it. Whereas, you know, the Americans or the Russians have kind of a different conception of how we should deliver these things. So I think it's a really interesting question. And from my perspective, that's going to be the really interesting dynamic to watch going forwards. And I think, you know, it's uh, I'm sure going to be the subject of a paper or two that I'll try to write in the not too distant future. Um, I think, you know, and I'll briefly touch on your third question because I, uh, uh, again, conscious of time and I would love to hear uh, some more thoughts, you know, uh, on the differences between the kind of the elite and the uh, the average man. I think there is a clear difference. I mean, you'd find basic levels of Sinophobia, <laughs> you know, the kinds of stories I remember hearing on my first trips around the region were like, you know, when the Chinese companies came, suddenly all the animals got eaten, you know, right down to the donkeys and the dogs. And I'm like, really? You know, it, it was just this kind of fear of China, you know, this really basic Sinophobia. You know, and 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 you know, it, it was kind of that 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 elemental in a way. And um, but when you went to the governments and you talked to the elites, they were very keen on engagement with China. They saw the economic opportunity. They wanted it to come because they they knew their countries needed the investment. They saw China as an important economic partner. This was this was critical to them. So they were kind of willing and eager to engage at that kind of level. But it didn't sort of always filter down to the public. And there were protests that happened at various moments, which you know caused big projects to get suspended. But I think, you know, I'd add, I'd add a fine, I'd add a twist to that, uh, which is, you know, that that's the kind of, if we, if we simplify, that's the view. But what's interesting is you've seen over time how Chinese companies have tried to adapt. And there are actually increasingly a growing number of companies that are hiring more locals on the ground that are trying to really try to mesh themselves more into the local communities. And so the narrative that the locals hate it all and don't benefit just isn't true. You know, I can think of the Confucius institutes I visited around the region, which are always full of young Central Asians wanting to learn Mandarin. You know, I think of the first time I went on a regional trip for this project in into Tajikistan in, you know, 2011 or 2012, I can't remember now. Um, you know, I struggled to find anyone who spoke Mandarin, you know. <laughs> I struggled to find anyone who really was interested or was working for Chinese company. When I went just before the pandemic 
stopped all travel, you know, in late 2019, I, I found dozens of, you know, Tajiks who spoke very good Mandarin, were learning it, wanted to go. Whenever I go to the Confucius Institutes, there were always people who wanted to learn Mandarin because they saw this was an economic opportunity they wanted to grab. So I think, you know, if we simplify it, we say elites, very pro, at a more public level, less. Uh, but actually, I think that's probably, it's more sophisticated and complicated than that, actually. And it does blend a little bit more. And I think there is more kind of a common acceptance now, um, increasingly. Um, to turn to uh, Dr. Wani's questions, um, looking more uh, really at Xinjiang, uh, which I think clearly draws on your own experiences and research. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a really, it's a really, uh, uh, you know, it's difficult because I think that, uh, you know, the central conception that I think the Chinese operate under is this developmentalist idea, right? That, you know, prosperity equals stability. You know, if people are rich and prosperous and have full bellies and a house and a dog and a cat and a wife and children, they won't want to rebel against the state, you know? And so ultimately, if we just achieve that kind of nirvana of economic prosperity, you know, this desire, this impulse for, you know, separatism will evaporate away. And I think I question that assumption, frankly. I'm not sure that logic works. I think you can look at lots of other contexts around the world where actually it doesn't hold and that hasn't isn't isn't what's played out. And so I think there's a fundamental problem there. And I think this is, you know, why I think you're seeing this push by China on the kind of re-education side, you know, because it's it's a kind of realization that, you know, yes, the economic opportunity is really important. Yes, the heavy security thing is, but how do you change people's minds? And you know, it's it's very it's 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 a difficult, if not impossible, thing to do. Dare I say it? Uh, but this is what they're trying to achieve with that. Um, and I think it's because you know it it's 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 just very difficult to see how you do achieve it. Um, I think on your on your second point about you know the kind of unification of the uh, Uyghur uh, people, uh, uh, kind of echoing the kind of you know uh, the push uh, that China's doing. It's it's a really interesting observation, you know, and it's one I hadn't. I must say, uh, thought about a huge amount, but it's um, it's certainly interesting to consider the degree to which you know um, uh, uh, the Uyghur uh, cause and community has become more uh, kind of unified as time has gone on, and I think you know trying to certainly played a, a significant role in doing that. What I would also say uh, to linger on this for just a minute is you know one of the more I think uh, uh, depressing elements I did find in my kind of research around the region in looking at this was you know people would often say, well you know what do Central Asians think about what's happening to the Uyghurs? And if I'm honest with you, the truth be told, I didn't find a huge amount of support in many ways uh, for the Uyghur people. It was, you know, the, you saw support for the Kazakh minorities in Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyz minorities in Kyrgyzstan, the Tajik minorities in Syria. You know, you saw support for them, but the Uyghur community, there was kind of a sense of, well, you know, and somehow they brought it on themselves and who knows why. And, you know, it was always depressing that you didn't see that kind of solidarity in some ways, uh, uh, in uh, Central Asia towards uh, um, the Uyghur community in particular. Um, what's interesting, of course, if we look at the militant side of the equation, that's certainly not what's happened. You can see there's been a very interesting kind of unification of Central Asian and Uyghur militant groups in Syria and in Afghanistan, um, you know, which is something that the Chinese are very worried about. They always point out that, you know, if you think about the kind of main umbrella group that uh, they worry about, you know, which the Chinese call the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, but calls itself the Hezbollah Islamic Turkestani, the Turkestan Islamic Party, you know, Turkestan is not just in Xinjiang. Turkestan is a much bigger conception across this entire region. And so it's interesting to think that, you know, in some ways the Uyghur kind of cause has managed in the militant world, certainly to sort of unify itself in this way and appeal to this much kind of wider community. I know this is something that the Chinese have been very worried about. And I think this also underpins some of their kind of security concerns um, in the region. I'll maybe pause there, uh, and I'd love to hear uh, colleagues' thoughts or reactions. Uh. Great. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Pantoshi, for, uh, for the uh, observations. Um, Dr. Bani and uh, Professor uh, Ritwisha, would you like to uh, have uh, any other comment or observation that you'd like to share? Should I go first? Sure, sure. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Given the things I have been also to Xinjiang in 2013-14 and I visited China in 2015-16 and even Central Asia in 2015 for 2-3 months. What I see that what Chinese have done in Central Asia or even in other regions that they have made authoritative regimes more authoritative, authoritative regimes. 
first thing is that secondly they have managed the perception of political elite within those central asian republics for example when i was in xinjiang i went to that xinjiang normal university and xinjiang medical university during my field survey I saw most of the students from Kazakhstan, from Kyrgyzstan, from Tajikistan and Uzbekistan were from political elite. And that to me is a sort of corruption. They have tamed the political elites of Central Asia in such a way that even the Uyghurs by descent who are living in Zing who are living in Central Asian republics are being sil silenced by the political elites of Central Asia. But the Gwar authoritarian government is of Central Asia. What is your take on that? Secondly, given this changing situation in Afghanistan, and Russia is now having much of its forces in Ukraine fighting a war, how you see the future of Central Asia given the porous borders between Central Asia and Afghanistan, given the new terror groups now emerging from the afghan soil what do you think about the future of central asian republics if the russian russian forces are moving towards ukraine now the borders are open now what do you think that what will be the future of central asia and chinese relation If I, I need quickly, your observation only, sir. If I may just quickly add to that, uh, you know, uh, we hear a lot uh, these days about Russia-China um, uh, alliance, uh, you know, in the perspective of uh, Ukraine uh, crisis. So where do you think Central Asia uh, will figure if there is this kind of an alliance, if this kind of an alliance ever uh, take off? So what would be the role of Central Asia? Ritisha, the, um, uh, Professor Ritwisha, uh, would you like to have, I mean, uh, do you have any comment to share or yes. question? Yes, just a brief one. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'll I'll just uh, I'll, I'll prod uh, Raffaello a bit in the in the sense that um, I find this a very compelling uh, account. Um, it's it's what I would say uh, an oral history of BRI. <laughs> so um, that's that's the kind of you know book that it is, and therefore I will uh, sort of prod you in the direction of BRI, the future of BRI, as it were. Um, uh, would you say that uh, BRI in Central Asia is very individual, uh, you know, individual lived experience, uh, a kind of experiment that China looks forward to repeating in other places? And I know it kind of ties up with my previous question, if there is a replica of a region, uh, you know, Central Asian region elsewhere. Uh, yes, I totally agree with you. When we look at Africa, that's that's a different ballgame altogether because we're looking at very different um, sociocultural context. Um, but at the same time, policy level, at the, at the level of policy makers, the Chinese policy makers, are they kind of looking forward to replicating this experiment or they already know that it's it's a done deal, what what was done in Central Asia remains in Central Asia and it's it's not that you know, can carry forward the momentum um, of Central Asia elsewhere. So um, in, in that sense, uh, do you see Chinese policy makers having a kind of, uh, you know, a a kind of acceptance of BRI's limitations. Um, the best that BRI could do was actually in Central Asia, and beyond that, perhaps uh, there is no replica available. Is is has that sense kind of set in with uh, the Chinese policymakers? And second, um, um, how the region has uh, been in in terms of uh, how how receptive has it been? You did say that, and it ties up with uh, Ezaz's earlier question, there has been a management of uh, elite class. Um, there has also been a management of, uh, you know, the common citizenry, as it were, because the fruits of development were quite, um, I mean, they were quite obvious for everybody to see. So the change that you saw in Central Asian uh, region in terms of the people being more receptive to learning Chinese language now than they were, say, a decade ago. That's that's reflective of that kind of a change in perception of the common people in the region. Uh, but now, what is the expectation of the region? And you very provocatively uh, title your book as Empire. So the 
I mean, the provocation is more in that direction. Do the region, uh, do the people in the region, do they realize that they are part of an empire? Because that's that's a very provocative word to use for a uh, sphere of influence. Usually in world politics and how we look at geo strategy, geo economy, uh, the empire hasn't really been used for anyone else but uh, you know U.S. in the contemporary times. I mean, one is not really looking at history here, but in the contemporary times in the last fifty years. So now the new empire on the horizon the people have that sense of the term here in this region um, i'll rest i'll rest here with and i'll wait for your comment dr pantushi you will have another maybe 4 to 5 minutes to answer okay yeah. i will do my best to be as compact as i can these are uh, uh, interesting questions all i think look i think um i think your uh, first point about uh, the making the authorities more authoritarian uh, i agree it's uh, it's I think the the problem in some ways with the Chinese approach is it's so kind of statist at a government level that it does support whatever government is in power and you know for good or for ill frankly um, and we've seen lots of contexts where that's caused issues and you know if you've got a, a government in power that's you know of an authoritarian bent well it will continue in that direction but the key point I make is that the Chinese don't support the government if it suddenly falls <laughs> you know and you could see lots of examples around the world in this region as well where they've kind of flipped on a dime in Afghanistan as I say they flip from supporting the republic government to supporting the Taliban without really skipping a beat you know what i mean so i think that from their perspective it's really engaged with whoever's in power and that's what we're kind of going to focus on um i think on your point about on your question about uh, how central asia was being impacted by the trouble in afghanistan look i think that you know it's the central asians i think were very worried uh, about afghanistan falling apart and i think they still are and they've got good reason to be as we're discovering if we see the recent rocket attacks that uh, iskp has been firing across the border into tajikistan into uzbekistan uh, we look at the growing volume of kind of extremist material that Uh, uh, ISK is putting out in Central Asian languages the fact that it's not very clear that the Taliban are trying to rein in some of the Central Asian groups in the north uh you know all of that speaks to me uh to many good reasons why the Central Asians be quite worried and if we look at what's happening at the moment in Badakhshan in in, um, in Gorda Badakhshan in, in Tajikistan you know we can see how 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 the kindling is there you know what i mean it's very difficult to know if that's directly linked to this but you know also think back to the beginning of the year and the chaos was here in kazakhstan you know who who expected that you know what happened in kazakhstan the sudden you know chaos in the country having to call in foreign soldiers to help protect itself that really it, it, you know showing instability in kazakhstan in that way was i think shocking to everybody but it really reflects actually how febrile things can become in this region very abruptly and how in some ways you don't always have a pulse of that so i think they're all very worried and i think they have in some ways reason to be personally i think the country which i'd be most concerned about is tajikistan uh, because the, the sort of state apparatus there is probably uh, you know the weakest frankly of the ones that share the border in turkmenistan we don't really know what's going on but what we do know is the turkmen government's got a pretty good track record of having good relations with the taliban um and so i think that there and there's things that happen across that border which i think people want to protect so I think in some ways I'd worry about what happens in Tajikistan. I think that's where most people's sort of worries are focused at the moment. Um on the question of China and Russia and kind of where uh, Central Asia fits into this kind of bigger uh, geopolitical picture. I think this is this is an interesting one and one that we came up with came up against a number of times because people would, you know, constantly point to everyone's always looking for the two to disagree and pick a fight in Central Asia. And what I can tell you is they're not going to <laughs> because for both powers you know the geopolitical alignment that they're in at the moment between Moscow and Beijing which is against the west is infinitely more important than anything that could happen frankly in these five countries in between them you know and so there are tensions there but i think the other point i'd say on this is that you know uh, there was a sense of when the chinese started building these bases a lot or this base on the border with uh, Tajikistan and Afghanistan that this is going to be expansion of chinese military power in the region Hold on a second. <laughs> this is the Chinese worrying about that specific border and worrying about the risk that that border might present to them. This is a very narrow security concern and this is always what it is. They're always worried about security issues, but they're worried about it once about impact them. And they look at everything in a very transactional light. And so if we look at China's relations with this region, it's all about this deal, that deal, this transaction. You know what I mean? Whereas when we look at what we see happening from a kind of a Russian view of this world, it's much more kind of paternalistic view. you know and we can see that the russians take kind of different steps so the two i think seem happy to operate in parallel and i think undermining all of the sort of tensions that might pop up 
is the fact that the geopolitical alignment is kind of critical to both of them, and that's what they're going to kind of focus on. The the loss in this, and the thing that's always kind of frustrated me in some ways, is that the 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 losers in this are the Central Asians because they lose agency. And the Central Asians try to play a game of this multi-vector diplomacy, playing everyone off against each other. Well, if they're too biggest actors engaging in their region have kind of come to a tacit agreement between each other about how they want to proceed um, and how they're not going to get in trouble. It does kind of complicate that. And this is where I think the West and countries like India should really be stepping more in to help give these countries more options and help give them greater agency in sort of in, in, in striking this balance. Um, so I think that's how it kind of fits in. That's how I put Central Asia within this concept. Um, and then the final uh, uh, you know, two questions from Tisha, I think on the future of BRI, its limitations. Um, I think, you know, BRI, its limitations were that it was, you know, allowed to get just so big, you know what I mean? There was so much froth attached to BRI. It was this sort of, you know, the, you'd have leaders going, it's like multi-billion dollar deals, we're doing this, we're doing that, you know, and, and actually a lot of money, frankly, probably got lost along the way, you know? And so I think what we've seen happening over the past few years, and you'd already see this happening, I would argue, in Central Asia a little bit before you see it happening everywhere else, was kind of a, an attempt to, uh, you know, scale things back. You know, try to make sure that actually you are investing in projects that you're going to get the money back on. You know, you must remember this, you know, BRI is not aid. <laughs> these are investments. <laughs> I mean, these are projects that they want to return on. So if you're investing in countries that have zero chance of returning your investment, then you're just throwing money away. And I think what you've seen happen over the past few years is a kind of a realization of that. And you could see some of the early signals of that in Central Asia. If you look at some of the projects in Tajikistan, you look at some of the projects in Kyrgyzstan, where it became abundantly clear that the locals are going to struggle uh, to make the repayments. And in fact, you know, there's a train line that they've been talking about building for a very long time across Kyrgyzstan to Uzbekistan that, you know, just never kind of gets done because, frankly, the Chinese can't get the Kyrgyz to sign up to the agreement terms that they want and they don't just want to throw this money away they want the thing to work and they want to get their investment back so i think that you know the limitations are that you know you invest in countries that have you know weak governance structures problematic management structures corruption you you, you have a set of problems that comes with that and if you're trying to make money out of this and make sure you get your investment back then you have to work around it and so i think some of that indicators you could see in Central Asia, and I think you can see in lots of other parts of the world. Um, on the final uh, question you asked about empire, and uh, you're right, it is a sort of provocative uh, word to put into the title. Um, but I think, you know, the, the reason was that, you know, I think the region, you can see across Central Asia, I would argue, that they can see that China is kind of a coming power, an important power, and one that will be significant to them. Um, you know, Russia is still clearly more important. You know, if we just look at sort of remittances, you know, labor migrants, uh, you know, if you look at the Kyrgyz or the Tajik economies, about a third of their, you know, GDP is generated by remittances, which is young Kyrgyz and Tajiks going to work in Russia for the most part, you know, and that is not a flow that you could shift over to China. There's enough labor in China, you know, there's no need for young Kyrgyz and Tajiks to go there. And they also don't speak the languages, so how are they going to do it? You know, even if they did speak the languages, it's a very challenging market to go and, you know, be a, a low-end worker in. So, you know, the, the economic tie still goes north, and so Russia is still really critical. But everyone can see that China is kind of the coming force. And there is that kind of sense of concern and trepidation that you always see. And I think what's interesting, and I think where you see people always, people always looking for this, I always found in the region, was evidence of Chinese trying to use leverage. You know, they always were looking for how is it that the Chinese are using leverage of these deals, of these projects that a government has signed to ultimately try to take over our country and do something there. And during the pandemic, this, uh, this fear was really brought to life by uh, some articles that started circulating on the Chinese internet that um, uh, were basically produced by, I think, a, a clickbait farm in Xi'an. <laughs> you know, it was produced for the Chinese market. It was produced for basically Chinese nationalists, telling them that all these neighboring countries weren't really countries, neighbor, neighboring countries. They were actually part of China. You know, so it was a clickbait set of articles that were published. But someone in Kazakhstan decided to translate one and published it. And because, you know, everyone knows the Chinese media is very state controlled, they assumed, oh, my God, this is what the Chinese state thinks. Now, I don't actually think this is what the Chinese state thinks, to be honest with you. I think this was just, you know, someone in Xi'an trying to attract some eyeballs to their, you know, website. And so they published some provocative articles. You know, frankly, there's lots of these clickbait farms around the world. Um, but that's not how it was seen in the region. And it really caused a ruckus, you know, that led to the local embassies in uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, 
Um, actually, I'm not sure about Kyrgyzstan. I know that in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, you know, putting out statements, basically refuting these articles or saying that, no, 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 this is, you know, not the case. And, but I think that really spoke to something that worried people in, it, it speaks to a concern that does exist within Central Asia about how they can see that this is kind of the coming power. You know, it's worth remembering that these countries are only 30 years young. You know, they're only just, they're new countries. They're still forging their kind of national identity. You know, Rahman, the leader of uh, Tajikistan, has been in power basically for the entire country's existence. You know, so you've got, you know, it, these are new countries in many ways. And for them to have just shed one overlord, to then hand it over to another, that's, you know, not what they want. They want the kind of agency. And this is where I think the big policy recommendation, I, I hope, emerges from this discussion, which is this is why outside powers need to engage with this region to help give it more agency and help it determine its own uh, sort of path forwards. And I'll, I'll pause there, conscious I did drift over time. Apologies, uh, uh, Antara. <laughs> well, uh, with that, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Pantushi. And with that, we have reached the very end of our discussion today. I think uh, this has been a very rich, lively, and thought-provoking discussion with lots of food for thought. So uh, thank you all once again. Thank you, Dr. Pantushi, Professor Ratusha Tiwari, and Dr. Vani for your participation. Uh, we'll be back soon with uh, yet another interesting book and uh, with yet another stellar panel. Till then, bye-bye and take care. <laughs>